Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Zoom Land and the 2021 Talking History series proudly presented to you, to you by the History Trust of South Australia. My name is Greg Mackey. I have the privilege of being the Chief Executive Officer of the History Trust of South Australia, and it is my very happy uh, responsibility to first start by acknowledging that the History Trust of South Australia acknowledges the First Nations people of South Australia, whose connection to country and living cultures began in time immemorial and continues to the present. We affirm our commitment to advancing the uh, to advancing reconciliation, and indeed, at the History Trust, we are very proactive in advancing our own reconciliation action plan, and we look forward to continuing to build our shared knowledge, our shared understanding, and a shared approach uh, to sharing the country. Now, uh, as we all know, we had to move from our very, very popular and very, very successful and much loved uh, live gatherings at the Torrens Parade Ground Drill Hall uh, for Talking History when COVID um, uh, came into our lives just, just on a year ago. Um, we all have now become so much more familiar with utilising uh, these platforms. And um, while there's never anything quite the same as sharing a glass of cheer and a nibble with friends and colleagues uh, in the same place at the same time, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to you all as members of the History Trust family for your forbearance and, and for joining us in, in this way. I, it is my great pleasure now uh, to throw to my fabulous colleague, Dr. Christy Kukigi. Christy is, uh, is our Director of Public Engagement. That is a, a group of fantastic professionals uh, in, who work with the History Trust and, and of course, uh, many, many, many volunteers. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great uh, pleasure. Over to you, Christy. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and I just um, echo or second Greg's welcome back for 2021 Talking History. It's lovely to be back with you all finally. It really is my pleasure tonight to introduce this talk. I'm very, very excited to see the collaboration between the Maritime Museum and Andrew come to fruition. And it's, it's, it's great to, to have them here to share that, that journey with you tonight. So they're, they're talking about the windjammers and um, which, you know, so windjammers for those that don't know were these enormous steel and iron sailing ships that transported um, grain in South Australia in those final days of, of well, of commercial sail. Um, yeah, and, um, and I guess what Andrew and Adam are going to, to talk you through tonight is the development of an exhibition that tells that story um, and, and, and introduce some really exciting uh, digital, awesome immersive uh, experiences around that. Um, so here, how do you bring the age of sale into the 21st century and how do you create an immersive experience in a museum setting, which is something that Andrew's worked on, on a lot in his career. So I think we're in for, for quite the treat. And if you haven't already been down to see the exhibition, I'm sure you'll want to, if you're local, you'll, you'll want to get down to the museum uh, very soon. So um, our speakers are Dr. Adam Patterson, who is curator at the South Australian Maritime Museum and adjunct associate lecturer in archaeology at Flinders University of South Australia. And I've had the privilege of working with Adam for a number of years at the History Trust, and, and he's just an amazing, fabulous colleague with a wealth of knowledge um, and a really great collaborator. So again, it's really great to see this collaboration come to fruition. Uh, and Dr. Andrew Yip is our other speaker. Uh, and so, as I said, Andrew researches applications for immersive visualization and experimental digital technologies um, uh, around culture and heritage and, and sites and museums. So um, it's really great to have had Andrew working on this project with us. Now, Andrew lectures at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, but uh, he's got a, a raft of other experience and, and really, a really, really interesting CV that I'm sure if you're interested, I would uh, recommend you look up. So I'm going to actually just throw to our speakers now to, to take us on this journey through the age of sail and looking at the Windjammers and this new exhibition down at the Maritime Museum. Uh, thanks, Christy, Greg, and to all of our online guests as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening um, to share some of our recent work with you. Um, just going to share with you 
some images of the exhibition and um, start by giving you an overview of um, the history of windjammers in South Australian waters. Um, and then I'll hand over to Andrew um, partway through the talk and he will um, delve deeper into the development of the interactive experience in the gallery. Uh, so as Christy mentioned, windjammers were um, enormous ships um, and they were sailing uh, at the end of um, the age of sail from about the 1880s until um, 1949 in South Australian waters. Um, were, many of them were over 100 metres long. Um, they were barks, so they had um, they were, they were square rigged um, sails on the forward masts and then there'd be a jigger mast with um, fore and aft rig. Um, so this is Passat. Passat has four masts. Um, some barks had three, particularly the earlier um, windjammers. The masts were over 40 metres high. Um, at one time they sailed through all of the world's oceans on many different routes carrying um, uh, other car cargoes other than Australian grain, so American timber, uh, nitrates from Chile, um, but also wool and grain um, from Australian ports. Um, in the 1920s, there was a rapid decline in um, windjammers sailing, and that was because steamships um, were replacing them. Um, so a lot of the uh, ship owners were, were selling on their windjammers. Um, Need to adjust my screen a little bit. There we go. Uh, this photograph is um, some South Australian bagged grain at Port Lincoln. Windjammers would load about 50,000 bags of grain like this. Um, the work was done with the help of conveyor belts, derricks on board, um, but a lot of it was manual um, back breaking work. Uh, and after arriving in a port in South Australia, Ships might have to wait for several weeks to secure a cargo. Um, and even, even then there were no guarantees that they would secure one. Um, usually they did. Occasionally um, the ships would sail home with no cargo. It would take several weeks to load the cargo. Um, and steamships, of course, had high running costs. They couldn't afford to um, wait at a remote South Australian port. Or it would have been remote to the ship owners back in Europe. Um, and uh, so windjammers were able to um, provide a service that the steamship owners um, weren't able to. Um, they had much lower running costs. And one of the reasons that it continued for so long in South Australia was um, largely due to this man, Gustav Eriksson. Uh, he was a, an Orland Islander. Um, so the Orland Islands are a group of islands that sit between Sweden and Finland. Politically, they're part of uh, Finland, but they have their own identity. The people there speak Swedish. Um, they have a, a long seafaring tradition, mostly based around the Baltic Sea. Um, the Orland Islanders were farmers and they would trade their goods um, sailing around the Baltic. And uh, in the 19th century, they actually started venturing out and becoming um, blue water sailors. And it's at that time that um, fleets of windjammers started to uh, be built and bought um, by Orland Islanders. So Gustav Eriksson uh, was a sailor. He went to sea at nine years of age. Um, and by the time he was 18 or 19, he was the master of a Baltic trader. He then went into the blue water sailing um, but he had an accident in his 30s and wasn't able to sail anymore. So um, he, his love of uh, ships and the sea, though, continued and he became a ship owner. Um, by the 1930s, he had the largest fleet of windjammers um, in the world, and most of them sailed yearly to South Australia. Gustav Eriksson ran very small crews. So the Hertzog and Cecily, his pictured here on board the Hertzog and Cecily. 
was the flagship of his fleet. It was his pride and joy. And um, the previous owners had crewed the Herzog and Cecily with about 80 crew. Gustav Eriksson ran her with about 30. Um, and he was always looking to reduce his costs. He sailed his ships without insurance, um, but he, he took a keen interest in the maintenance of the ships. He personally inspected them when they arrived in the Orland Islands. He loved his ships and he loved the sea. Um, but he was a, a very shrewd businessman. Um, another reason that the trade continued for so long in South Australia was that the difficulty that these large sailing ships had um, or the, the difficulty that there was loading at South Australian ports. Um, this is Port Victoria. Um, many of you, or well, some of you may have seen this photo. It's been published fairly widely. It's in the State Library of South Australia's um, collection. It shows catches here uh, in the foreground. So there's, um, these are the catches, they're fore and aft rigged with uh, two masks. And then wind jammers waiting further out in the deep water. Um, Port Victoria was where the last grain race, commercial grain race left from in 1949. Um, and it became known as Mariam, the Mariam of the South. So Mariam was the capital city of the Orland Islands. Um, and the reason was it, it was the longest lasting Windjammer port in South Australia. Um, the catches would load the grain um, onto the wind jammers, which were waiting offshore there. They couldn't actually come alongside the jetty. The water was too shallow. Um, another important feature of the history of wind jammers at Port Victoria was the work of Aboriginal men from Point Pierce. Um, and they worked on the waterfront, loading the catches, sailing the catches. Um, the the York Peninsula is, is in the traditional lands of the Narunga people, but many Aboriginal people from the Eyre Peninsula and the Adelaide area um, also relocated here. So some of those um, cultural groups uh, were also employed in this industry. They also farmed and were involved in the whole process. So they're growing the grain, they're harvesting the grain, um, sowing the bags and also loading uh, the ships. This uh, keeping an eye on the time, um, I think we're going okay at the moment. Uh, the crews on Ericsson ships were also very young. Um, the youngest sailors were around 13 to 15 years old, and the average age was probably about 18. Um, the mates and the captains were a bit older, usually in their 30s or 40s, um, and some of the captains even older again. Um, this photograph shows uh, three of the sailors on um, Palmia in 1949. And just bring your attention to the young man on the um, left-hand side of the photograph with the ship tattoo on his chest. This is Alan Rogerson. Alan was 13 when he first went to sea in a windjammer and he rounded Cape Horn. Um, that was on board Palmia and this uh, his second trip, he was 16, um, 16 years old in this photograph. Uh, so he's obviously growing up fairly quickly with tattoos like that at 16 years of age. Um, although I'm sure for, for those of us who are uh, um, who, who enjoy tattoos, um, they're, they're quite attractive um, examples. Alan's collection of shipwright tools was uh, purchased by the museum several years ago. Um, and you can see them here in this photograph. This is a photograph of the new gallery. Um, it's one of the really beautiful aspects of this exhibition. Um, there's some fantastic tools there. Um, there's an Archimedes drill, um, which is fantastic. Um, I had to do a little bit of research myself to um, work out exactly what that one was. Um, and this is his uh, trunk as well, um, which we think may have um, belonged to someone else before Alan, um, before Alan had it. it. It seems to be a much older trunk than something from the 1940s. Um, and it also has a fully rigged ship rather than a windjammer painted on it. Um, 
it wasn't just men sailing on windjammers. So this photograph is Mary Lang. And she's one of only a handful of women who served as apprentices on windjammers. And she was sailing on Le Avenir. Our senior curator, Linda Lawton, identified about 30 women during the research for the exhibition. Um, but sometimes they traveled as passengers or as stewardesses, um, but even the passengers would sometimes work if they were, if, if they were inclined to do so. So Pamela Bourne was a, um, a British aristocrat. She was one of these passengers who enjoyed working on the ship. Um, and she boarded the Herzog and Cecily in Wallaroo. Um, and on the voyage to Falmouth, she fell in love with the captain of the ship, Sven Ericsson. They later married, um, but the ship was wrecked uh, not long after they arrived in the UK. So Pamela's story features in um, the latest temporary exhibition at the Maritime Museum. So the Windjammers exhibition is a core gallery and it's going to be there for quite a while, but I would encourage any of you who are interested in Windjammers and their history to get along to the museum within the next um, few months and then you'll have a chance to see um, Pamela and the Duchess as well. So the Duchess is the informal name um, given to the, the ship that has been Cecily. Uh, a very important and delightfully unexpected aspect of South Australia's Windjammers history is the link to the Orland Islands, um, and particularly the interactions between the young South Australians, uh, the British, the Americans, and the Northern Europeans and the Orlanders. Um, one of the areas that um, the sailors write about in their diaries and in their later recollections is the types of foods that were served. This is one of the cooks um, serving uh, lutefis, which is a type of uh, dried fish um, and would be stewed or, or turned into a, a, a type of um, soup. Uh, the foods were monotonous. Um, there was a, they, the sailors often say they knew the day of the week based on what the cook was cooking from week in, week out. There'd be the same food on a Tuesday, every Tuesday. Um, they included lots of salted meats, preserved meats, um, and they were almost always in some sort of soup or stew. Um, and some of the foods that were favoured by the Islanders were not to a taste of the Aussies. So one of the um, rare treats after a pig had been slaughtered was uh, blood pancakes and they would eat them for a day, several days afterwards. Um, and as you could imagine, this is one of the more contentious foods that was served on the Windjammers. In the rare times that the sailors had for recreation, um, they spend most of their time sailing these ships, particularly the first leg of the voyage. Um, heading for Cape Horn and rounding Cape Horn. Um, but when they did have some time to recreate, they would often sing together. Um, and often the sailors of, from the different nationalities would come together um, and sing, sing the same tunes, but with different, um, in their own languages and sometimes with um, altogether different words. Um, and simple instruments were carried on board by some of the sailors. This is a young Finnish sailor um, playing the accordion uh, and a photograph of the accordion that's on display in the gallery um, from the, this is in the South Australian Maritime Museum collection. Um, I did touch on the, the route that was taken just before, but I thought I'd include this just uh, in case some of you are unfamiliar with um, some of these landmarks. Um, that I'm, I've been talking about. This uh, image is from the, the exhibition as well, and it was chosen to um, communicate as effectively as we could the concept of a great circle route. Um, so these ships are sailing essentially from one side of the world to the other um, and back again, but they're doing it um, in the shortest possible way uh, by, by following a circular route around the globe. Um, they, they leave Europe, it's looking at, at Antarctica from um, the very southern point of view, arrive in South Australia and then sail around. Cape Horn is um, 
one of the, the key markers in the wedge and also crossing the equator. It would usually take between three and four months for a wind jammer to sail back from uh, Australia to the UK. And if you ask the captains if they were racing, they would usually say no. But they all took great pride in being the fastest wind jammer in any given year. And a key, a key marker in this was if they could make the voyage in 100 days or less. They called it breaking the 100. If they broke the 100, then they were a really good chance of being the fastest ship. We actually have a beautiful chart in the exhibition um, as illustrated, uh, hand coloured, um, and it has all of the, the, the winners and they're listed and um, almost all of them uh, made the passage of the voyage in um, under 100 days. So I thought um, just to give you a bit of an idea of some of the conditions that these ships sailed in, we play a short video of some historic footage um, from near Cape Horn. Uh, so you can see here the sailors up in the rigging with a foot rope and they have a jack stay as well for a handhold. And that's, that's about it. That's, that's all that keeps them up there. Um, the conditions are freezing. Uh, at times the winds are screaming, hurricane force winds, um, huge seas. You'll see in a minute there's water washing over the deck. Um, it's very wet in this scene here. Um, the sailors were constantly wet when they were rounding the horn. They, they write about, and some of the oral histories that we collected, that they were talking about being constantly wet, exhausted. Um, Maurice Carigliano, who we interviewed um, several years ago, he talked about um, sailors urinating into bottles and taking them to bed with them as a hot water bottle to try and stay warm. Um, so they're working in the rigging while the ships are pitching and rolling like this, um, getting uh, furling and unfurling the sails um, as the weather changes, as they need more or less sail. Um, sometimes the sails become frozen and they, they get stuck. They have to free um, frozen sails. Um, and of course, when sailing in conditions like this, um, it's a, a dangerous uh, undertaking. And often there'd be injuries during this part of the voyage and it very occasionally there'd be deaths as well. Um, but most of the, the sailors who round the horn look back on their time um, in the wind jam is very fondly. Um, these, these are life-defining voyages for these um, young men and, and women. Um, and it's something that uh, they never forget um, and uh, remembered uh, collectively when they um, created the, the Cape Corner Society. Um, and another sort of key point in the, the voyage was crossing the equator. Um, and that was marked by a ceremony called the Crossing the Line Ceremony. Um, this uh, case here in the the foreground of this photograph uh, tells that story and um, I won't go into it in too much depth. I've got another little video that I think will do it much better than I could. Um, but basically sailors who had never crossed the equator before were um, subjected to an initiation of uh, the ceremony and more experienced sailors would dress up in costumes, um, including King Neptune. That's King Neptune's trident. And uh, there's also a couple of certificates here that were given to um, the sailors after the ceremony when they changed from pollywogs to shellbacks, which was the name given to them, uh, to sailors who had crossed the equator before. Um, so now I'll play the, the film. It's actually one of the old history, it, it includes old histories that were collected um, just in the past uh, 12 to 24 months, as well as some that were collected in 2004. Um, and it was produced by um, uh, Living Stories, which is, um, uh, a, they've done a fantastic job. And these videos are in the gallery um, and provide a, a really intimate um, space to listen to the sailors' stories in depth, um, which contrasts really nicely, I think, with the, um, the interactive experience, which Andrew was talking about. Um, after the video played. Uh. 
I had been across the line. Crossing the line is crossing the equator. And to new chums who haven't, they put them through all kinds of ordeals. We didn't really know what to expect, but we were forewarned as to uh, what was going to happen. The novices are initiated into the realm of King Neptune. I had a two-piece uh, bathing suit. It was before the time of bikinis, but it was a two-piece. And I lent that to the uh, uh, man who was going to play the part of Queen Neptune. He was very glamorous. He had uh, a nice uh, long golden hair, had a chide and, and a crown on his head. And he had the top part of my... Uh, swimsuit and then a, a, a skirt and they suddenly appeared on deck and the captain greeted them very formally and welcomed them on board and uh, next thing is King Neptune of course and his courtiers came over the uh, bow and the forecastle head each one of us was dragged out of the forecastle to be um, initiated it was sat on the edge of a bath of course or the christening bath they usually made of a bath. They were usually painted with tar of some sort, some sort of a tar. The Australians who were being initiated, they got thoroughly tarred. Make believe hair cut, put them in all the soapy, soapy stuff over them, then shave them with this big wooden uh, make believe razor. And look through the binoculars for the equator, which is a line. And of course, that consisted of two bottles, and a tape was across that. And we'd, without realising it, of course, and we thought, oh, well, we'll look through that, and there's the line sort of thing. But, of course, the bottles were full of water. And as they put it up, <laughs> the yeah, uh, you got copped an eye full of uh, salt water. And when you were nice and uh, steady there, all of a sudden pushed you back into the tub. So it was quite a rough uh, ceremony for the initiates. Okay, um, yeah, so you probably noticed at the end of the video they were having a, uh, a drink of um, some sort of liquor. Um, that was a fairly rare occurrence on Nolan Jammer because they were working very, very um, hard most of the time. But um, heading into the equator and on the other side of the equator, um, there was, there was a, a change in the routines on board. So, um, Heading to the horn, they're, they're working uh, in watches, uh, four hours on, four hours rest. Um, but a lot of the time, they were all required um, because the sailing conditions required it. Um, but around the equator and in the trade winds in particular, they had more time for maintenance of the ships um, and a bit more time to socialize and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that'll do it for me. Um, and uh, I'd like to hand over to Andrew now. Thanks, Adam. And thanks uh, to the History Trust of South Australia for having me back again. It's been a while since um, I first came down to Adelaide, but um, uh, in 20, when was it? 2018 or 2019. But um, it's been really great working with Adam at Lindell and um, initially Kevin. Um, on this exhibition. And uh, I think we've been able to do something very, very exciting. Um, and thanks for everyone, thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm very um, also pleased to see so many people from Wooden Boat Associations. My son and I are very Wooden Boat curious at the moment. So if anyone's got any, um, anyone's got any hot leads on a, a beautiful little trailer sale, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, now, can you see my, you can see my screen, right? Give us a nod, Anna. Yep. So my background, uh, I've got a, a relatively diverse background, as Christy was saying. Um, I, my practice is based at UNSW, where I'm an um, artist and designer and also art historian. And pr uh, primarily I work with one particular lab called the iCinema Centre for Interactive Cinema Research, which you can see here in this screen. Um, this is a work I made based off um, historical records of the Second Battle of Villa Um, But my practice is looks at how we can use immersive visualisation and new forms of um, what we say embodied interaction. So um, 
full body experience with virtual environments. How we can use these technologies and these experiences in order to advance the causes of cultural heritage institutions. Um, so I work pr predominantly with museums and galleries on uh, reconstructive projects to figure out how we can uh, uncover, you know, lost knowledge or, or new experiences about historical sites through these reconstructive methodologies. So what you see on the screen at the moment is um, a one-to-one -one scale visualization that uh, one of two I've made for um, an exhibition of Marjorie Hinder's work currently showing at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, where I reconstructed the original architectural contexts and uh, aquatic physics of these two aquatic um, sculptures that she made, one of which is destroyed. Um, and so one of the challenges that, that I work with is how do we tell the stories of uh, these important human stories in cases where uh, traditional museology might not be best equipped to, to show it. So when we talk about the, the wind jammers, we, we, we think about these um, extremely perilous and brave uh, human endeavors, you know, sailing around the horn. Um, and we think about the romance of this, the last age, of the, the last days of the age of sail. Um, but we have to tell these stories only, you know, fragments of objects and artifacts that are out of their original context. And so when we began this project a few years ago, we started thinking about how do we uh, immerse um, viewers in the lived history of this experience um, while walking this line between, I guess, I suppose, a historical authenticity and um, the, the limits of what we can achieve in, in the museum environment. Um, so we wanted to tell the story of uh, a, a, the journey of these young men and women on the wind jammers. And with these sorts of things, my, um, my particular philosophy is to always start with the material. Um, you know, there's sometimes a, an impetus to think, okay, we need to have an interactive, you know, digital virtual reality sort of thing and reverse engineer the experience. But with this one as well, we started with the diaries of the sailors themselves. We started with archival photographs, um, amazing early film. And we, we used all of these resources to try to um, settle on the, the, I guess, the core human aspects of what it was like for a young man or woman to, to go on this journey. And um, what, we, what we ended up producing was um, what we call an immersive installation. So it's not a video or a, a film, although it borrows from those kinds of traditions, but it's actually what we call a real-time immersive visualization. So everything that you see, um, if you've been to the exhibition, everything you've seen or everything that you see that I'll show you in a minute is um, not canned and pre-shot like a film, but it's calculated in real time. Um, what that means is that 90 frames per second, it's every, every bit of the environment is rendered and that allows us to um, engage the audience to become a part of the story through their interaction. So Windjam is Immersive is um, an interactive story based off almost verbatim the diaries of three sailors and it's pre presented as this big um, panoramic um, projection on, um, translucent, on this translucent screen that we worked in conjunction with Mulloway Architects to engineer. And it's this beautiful, beautiful um, object itself that if you look behind it, 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 it looks like it has the, the ribs of a, um, uh, of a ship's hull and it can be seen uh, through it. And um, the audience engages with the work through um, motion detection. So the original design we came up with was to think about how an audience member can be very sort of like gently and subtly involved in the story in a way that um, suggests their agency, but without hitting them over the head with, you have to do this now sort of thing, or without getting them to use, you know, complex controllers. Um, so there are five uh, scenes in Windjammer's Immersive, and they tell the story of um, sailors starting out at Wallaroo and ending up um, in Liverpool. Um, and the, the way that the audience is embedded is that the, the system 
detects the behavior and um, uh, well, detects the behavior of the audience in the space and will change the parameters of the immersive to uh, respond accordingly. Predominantly, this happens through this weather system that we engineered. So, I mean, it sounds very science fiction, fiction and it is, but it's, very, it's also very simple. The more the audience, um, the, the denser the audience and the more they interact in the scene, so experimenting with movement and gesture and stuff like that, the installation um, detects their movement through motion capture. And then they can have an impact on all the atmospheric effects, the quality of the sea and certain mechanical elements. So here, for example, this capstan um, that I made from um, archival images, um, if the audience uh, moves in the space, uh, it will turn. Um, and there are other elements as well, like the generation of clouds. And here, the, 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 the ocean behavior is not so important, but throughout there's a kind of persistent living environment that does its own things. It behaves like an ocean would behave, but um, the audience can sense their own presence in the work because the environment will change in accordance. Um, so for example, I'll show you a clip in a second um, of this is rounding the horn. This is, this is what I always thought of as, you know, the kind of marquee moment where, where it's, um, you know, you know, death is on the line. Um, very evocative, um, very, very trying human experience. And in this particular scene, um, the audience's behavior will cause, you know, the capstan to rotate. It will also cause the ocean to change between three different states of behavior from a small storm to, um, uh, to a larger storm. And then this sort of like uh, gale forced um, uh, moment where lightning breaks out and the clouds roll in and you can see that there are all these particle systems that, that, that um, become more and more intense. Um, you know, water splashes up over the hull, uh, the, the water splashes onto the screen itself so it feels like the audience member is being doused in water. Um, and uh, uh, all of these tiny little subtle bits together mean that um, it, it gives a sensation of being in a reactive environment where no two viewings of wind jammers can ever be the same because there are um, a, a million combinations uh, that, that the audience can encounter, including, for example, the time it takes for the ship to, um, uh, to make the journey from Australia to England. So on each scene, there's like a kind of cinematic cut screen and the latitude and longitude and day uh, of the journey um, is generated based on the behavior of the audience. And those are taken from the ship's logs. So it means that sometimes the, the ship will always travel um, at, a, at a different rate. So there's tiny little impacts that the, the audience has on the world. Um, I'll show you, how are we going for time? Because I, I, um, Christy, what time do I have to, uh, what time do we have to stop and take questions? Yeah, look, uh, we're, we're already at time, but I think it's been really interesting and we're getting lots of questions and some good feedback. So I think we can take another 10 minutes, given that we started a little bit late, if you're okay with that. Okay, okay. Because what I want to show, you, I haven't got, I'll, I'll talk about the process in a minute, but I want to show a video now of um, the rounding the horn scene. Now, I'm aware that, um, Adam, when you showed your video, it was a little bit jerky. So um, because of the internet connection. So when I show mine, just keep in mind that it's a real, like, you know, it's a really fluid scenario. Um, we're going to watch two scenes from the immersive, uh, the, the rounding the horn and then leading into the funereal scene. And the, the text that's read out by the actor. So we have a, a we engage an actor to play the part of these three amalgamated sailors. And he's basically reading almost verbatim the diary entries of um, of, uh, of two sailors um, describing their trip around the horn and the falling from the spars of one of their uh, um, uh, one of their their colleagues. Okay, so you'll see first of all you'll see the the waves, the environment adapting in real time to the movement. Seas are getting bigger and are breaking over the upper deck. We've spent nearly all day rigging lifelines over the ship. Evidently, we are nearing Cape Horn. Everything is 
wet, the wind was blowing over 100 miles per hour, forcing us to take in foresail. Water covered the deck and one wave chased Andy the cook down the alleyway. The consequences of the storm were a blown out crowjack. went aloft to remove ice from the four upper top gallon. But quickly, and half an hour later, we were heaving the yard aloft with the capstan. A gasket snagged on the weather clue. The somber than a burial at sea. No diversions as might be found at home. At sea, there's no pretense, no hiding from a man's true character. And liked him well. We carried his shroud-wrapped body to the rail and with a dull plot, committed him to the deep. Putting the ship before the wind again, we sailed on. So you see um, uh, the the kind of I suppose um, experiential authenticity we, we went for, um, trying to convey the um, the drama and the the affect of the moment rather than being strictly literal. So for example, that the burial at sea scene is very surreal, um, and you will have noticed that there are these particles of snow that drift across the deck and settle on the body and, and whatnot. So when the audience, the, the, the audience members, um, the snowfall reacts to their behavior. So it will, it, will, um, it will lessen or intensify based on how many people there are in the room at the time and what they're doing. And that was meant to be this kind of like poetic and surreal evocation of, of that idea of standing at a funeral or, you know, casting, you know, dirt onto the coffin or, you know, petals or something like that. Um, and, and that was one of the ways that we tried to evoke a sense of presence without being too literal. So you do feel like you're in attendance, but you don't, um, it's not an overbearing um, um, requirement for you to do something. Um, so I'll quickly talk about the process a bit. So the, uh, I made probably like 99% of, um, of everything you've seen um, by hand from reference photos. So here you see the initial scene, um, I'll show you. So this, this is uh, Wallaroo with, um, there were rail carts on the, 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 the side with um, these, the bags of wheat that um, uh, Adam showed before and, and various bits. They're very characteristic smokestacks in the, in the background and, and uh, very identifiable sheds. Um, all of those were made from these archival shots uh, and photos of the wharf at various points in its life cycle. Um, here you see the other side of the model, the other side of what the, 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 the scene from what I showed you before. Um, everything, as I said, everything you see, I showed you is, it, is part of like a living world. It's all calculated on the fly, which means that um, the, the, the physics are different, the lighting is different every single time. Um, and on that, I, I spent quite a lot of time modeling and rendering uh, objects from the, the Maritime Museum's collection. So here you see, uh, obviously, a very rusty knife, a saw, and a lantern that are all collection objects. And I made these virtual replicas with very high resolution textures and use a process called physics-based rendering so that the behavior of the various models under illumination or under physics 
mimicked the, the behavior of that particular material. So for example, you can see here this, um, the, the lantern, the metal um, isn't, doesn't just look rusty, it's got actually raised, uh, raised areas and indentations that are characteristic of that kind of corrosion. So when the light passes over it, the, the bumps get picked up and um, it behaves like it behaves like a, um, a, a, a you know a, a real piece of metal should. So there's quite a lot of um, visual effects that, that go into this. So on the left, this is a this is a screenshot from the the engine that I use to um, create the, the the work. On the left, you can see the raw sort of building blocks of the scene, and on the right here you see the, here's the lantern, for example. Um, you see the, um, the, the kind of post-cinematic um, effects that we put in. So things like the, 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 the porthole glass, um, you know, the rendering and the reflections change in real time. You can see I made these um, objects, these 3D models of various um, collection objects. For example, the, the, the accordion, all of these tools were, in, I think many of them were in the exhibition. And the same is true for a lot of these details. They, the collection objects appear all the way throughout the, um, the, the installation. So it's kind of like um, Easter eggs, we call them. Um, I'll just say one, one more thing quickly um, about the, the, I guess, the sense of um, experiential authenticity that we wanted to go for. So the, the, this kind of production is very um, similar to traditional you know, cinematic production, I suppose, in that you need you know, artists and directors and, and um, uh, actors and composers. And absolutely critical is the, um, uh, the, the, the audio design. And so I commissioned um, a composer called Gary Daly on the right here uh, to compose the score. And I worked very closely with him and a, and a really excellent sound engineer and we produced um, a very, very beautiful um, cinematic score, uh, well, a bunch of cinematic score elements for the work. And I commissioned Gary because he is a special, he's a, he's a specialist in um, accordion composition and performance. If anyone has uh, young children or, or grandchildren, you've seen La La's big live band on the ABC, he's the accordion player for La La. Um, but he has this incredible knowledge of um, accordion uh, performance. And so we decided to make this object, uh, the kind of hero of the audio score being another form of presence. You know, these sailors sitting on the, 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 the forecastle and like, you know, playing the accordion in downtime. And we actually made um, a lot of the sound effects from um, the mechanics the, 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 the accordion and the piano as tools themselves. So uh, for example, I'll show you, um, uh, I'll play this for you. So that's, that, that, that sound effect is, it runs all the way through the um, crossing, the, the, the rounding the horn scene. And it's meant to evoke the kind of rumbling of the storm and also the reverberations of the ship's hull, you know. Um, and we made that by Gary um, uh, using the interior of this magnificent concert grand piano as a percussion instrument. So he would bang on the harp, um, bang on the strings, and we had a series of microphones set underneath the instrument to pick up these uh, harmonics. Um, and the same with uh, every most of the sounds of the wind and the creaking of the deck were made from the actual mechanical movements of uh, one of a number of uh, accordions, uh, like this. So hopefully you can hear that and it's a bit soft, but we made that by um, pulling apart the accordion slowly so you could hear it breathe and then capturing the creaks of the, the, the wood as it was compressed again. 
So the same is true for all of those, all of the knocks and visual, of the sound effects you hear, they're all made um, out of the, the mechanisms of, of um, the instruments themselves. Okay, I think I should stop there, shouldn't I? Um, that's just a, a pretty brief sort of introduction, but if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to go see it and uh, play around because there are all these times, oh, yeah, I didn't even tell you about all the interactions. So, you know, in the second scene where they're talking about, um, you know, sailing quite south and they can see the aurora and you can create an aurora um, and, you know, these porpoises leap out of the water and there's this, uh, these, um, you know, phosphorescent algae blooms that blah, 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 blah. It's, go, go have a look. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. That's, look, thank you so much, Andrew and Adam. It's always, I mean, you know, I'm a, I was a curator many years ago, but it's still always so fascinating to just take a peek under the hood and see how exhibitions are researched and how they develop and how that audience experience is thought through. Um, yeah, it's fabulous. Um, so much rich stuff in there. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time talking, although I could. I've got so many notes here and questions I want to ask. But we've got quite a few from the audience. So I'm going to go with the most popular one uh, first. And Adam's already actually flagged that he would like to answer this because it's about the catchers and the role they played. So the first question is, were the catchers involved in any trade of their own or did they purely act as tenders to the wind jammers? Uh, yeah. Yes, catchers did engage in trade of their own. They were coastal trading vessels um, and they were used uh, to, to carry cargo between um, ports across South Australia, um, from Port Adelaide down to the southeast. Um, the Gulf ports. Um, they also carried wheat from what was called outports. So I didn't, I didn't mention the outports, but um, places like Balgowan, uh, which is not that far from Port Victoria, um, and there are many other small ports um, that catchers would visit and pick up bag grain and then transport to a, another larger port like Lincoln or Wallaroo, um, Port Victoria, um, for the wind jammers to, to load. Um, yeah, and the catch trade continued for a lot longer than the wind jammers. Um, Nelsabi and Faley were sailing um, right up to the 80s. So uh, there, there used to be about 70 or more catches in South Australian waters. I hope that's a sufficient answer. Yeah, look, that, that's great, Adam. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's funny, you always think of the, the romance and grandeur of the Age of Sail and the catch story is such a, an, a, an amazing South Australian story too. Mm. But yeah, your, your presentation just really struck home for me in terms of it's just really hard work. And rounding Cape Horn, I can't imagine how kids like Alan, at what did you say he was 13 when he first went around the Cape? I mean, that's phenomenal. The the really harrowing um, journey he would have taken as a, a young 13 year old. Um, yeah, so fascinating. So I imagine for those that are local, um, you'll want to explore these stories more and, and jump into Andrew's immersive experience, that really authentic sort of experience at the Maritime Museum. Now we have lots of other questions. Um, the next question is, Ah, okay. Yeah, some people were getting excited about the tools, Adam, as you were talking about the tools. But do um, do we have photos of the shipwrights, their tools, and the working conditions uh, when they affected repairs to the wind jammers before the home voyage? Uh, we have photographs of the crew maintaining the ship. Um, to be honest, I'm struggling to think of one where it's clearly a shipwright. There was a lot of chipping of rust and painting that went on. Um, and we've got photographs of the sail maker um, from Passat uh, working. Um, but I'll, I'll have to go back through and um, look at the archive. Um, I'm beginning to think maybe I overlooked something in putting the exhibition together. Um, I hate to say it, but... Um, We've got these wonderful uh, digital object labels. So we've got a facility to add some extra photographs and films and things like that, um, or videos. 
And with the tools in particular, I'd like to include some videos of the tools being used um, so that um, people can understand their use a bit more easily. Um, you know, a, a few sentences of text about how to use a, an Archimedes drill um, doesn't really communicate it anywhere near as effectively as watching someone use one. Yeah, great. Um, excellent, thank you. Uh, another question, this one's about an expression and, and where, it, um, where it originates from. So does the expression all tarred with the same brush have an origin to do with the tarring of men in the crossing the line ceremonies? Is there any link between, or do you know? Like you said, there's so much research and so many rabbit holes you can go down. Yeah. Um, no. Well, I don't know is the short answer. Yeah, not to my knowledge. I didn't come across that in my research, but um, perhaps it's there somewhere. Um, it'd be interesting to find out. Um, I wonder if anyone in the audience has any ideas about other uses or punishments involving tar. Not that crossing the line was a punishment. Yes, no matter how much it may have looked like one from yeah. that video you played. <laughs> uh, excellent. Uh, we have a comment, sorry, a comment that's just come through. The reactive elements programmed into the visualization a genius, such an interesting way to bring history to life. Yeah, so I agree, Andrew, like I'm, I mean, as you know, like I have a passion for how we uh, rethink the visitor experience, because we always talk in museums about wanting audiences to have these transformational experiences. And you don't get that from reading text on a wall and, and just object, but, but it is, uh, and so your work around experiential authenticity and drawing on all those historical sources, but never equating a digital sort of immersive experience with, with you know, an actual real history one. And acknowledge, I, I just strikes me that your research and your practice is is fascinating. And, and are, there, are there other instances that people can see? Because we've got a lot of uh, audiences regionally and interstate, I mean, where else can people uh, see your work? Um, my work, um, I don't think there's anything else in <laughs> Adelaide at the moment, but um, the Marjorie Hinder exhibition that, that is at the Art Gallery of New South Wales is going down to Heidi Museum in Melbourne, which is a bit closer. Um, but if anyone is interested in like interactive museology, then ACNI, the Australian Centre for Movie Image at uh, Melbourne is the place to really go. But also MOD, um, at uh, UniSA um, is really good. Well, I mean, I've been there. A couple, I haven't been there for you know obviously a while, but um, Mod was. I think it has it does really good stuff. So um, that's um, that's just uh, yeah. What's the gosh? I forgot the main street of Adelaide's name, but um, <laughs> North Terrace. You know where you know <laughs> it's on the North Terrace. Um, that's right. We'll, we'll provide a link in, in the email we send out to people later. So we'll let them know because I agree, MOD is, is fabulous. Um, yeah, but I, I think that these sorts of things are, you know, just part of like new museology, right? Because, you know, all it's it's just part of serving the serving the, the mission and heritage of the museums, you know, just in a way that a wall label is a tool that we use, you know, as, you know, historians and curators or whatever to convey meaning. Um, we can use different texts, and these are just the these are just the texts of um, of our time. Um, I say I say that because it allows me to buy PlayStation games and write them off on tax. But um, so I'm very committed to the idea that this is this is the the academic text of our time. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Uh, listen, we've got uh, because I guess we we have. Uh, a larger than usual um, non-Adelaide audience tonight. We've got a couple of questions about access to the exhibition. So these are probably for you, Adam. Is there any chance of the exhibition touring to other capital cities and or are there other photos available for people to delve a bit deeper and have a have a bit of, get a bit of a sense of what the exhibition is like in the Maritime Museum? Okay. Um... The photographs of the exhibition itself are not online yet, um, but 
photographs of windjammers and um, the crew working on the ships and things like that um, from our collection. They are online through Recollect, um, which is our collection portal recently um, uh, published, I believe. Um, so you can, you can, you can access them. Um, and as for touring, the core gallery is unlikely to tour, um, but elements of it will be um, put online so you can um, access them. So we're planning on um, putting in the oral history, the, the short films that have been made with the oral histories um, online, and they are, they are a fantastic um, resource in their own right. Um, and if anyone you know is doing research and wants to access the whole oral histories, we would provide those as well. Um, Pamela and the Duchess, which is the temporary gallery, um, we haven't shown any photographs of that tonight. I don't think um, that may or it has the, it has a potential to um, to a, but at this stage there's no plans. Um, it's just it's in a format that would allow touring. Um, so if there's a lot of um, enthusiasm, and it seems that there is, then it, maybe that's something that we can look at down the track. Great. Okay. Well, we'll um, we'll keep everyone uh, tuned into any developments there. Uh, we have one last question, and then we are actually going to have to wrap it up. Um, Oh, we've got two now, but Andrew, this one's for you. It's a specific question about um, those 3D object scans that we saw some of the images of. So I know you do a lot of work in scanning historical objects uh, and sites and, and all sorts, but I'm uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process. I mean, I imagine it's quite a lengthy one, but. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so all, all of the, I mean, I, I think in Windjammers, the I didn't have any scans. I think I made everything from scratch. Um, so, just just a brief diversion. So, making things from scratch is is basically like um, you know CAD modeling, you know architectural modeling, but for you know other objects. It's a little bit different because um, in a um, in this interactive uh, cinematic environment, we also produce textures and all sorts of other things. It's like the Pixar workflow, where you build a 3D model of something and then you know, paint it sort of thing. Um, but yes, I do do a lot of scanning, usually of collection artifacts. And I'll show you, I'll show you now, uh, for example, a, uh, an object from that you'll be, everyone will be very familiar with, um, the Star of Greece figurehead. And this one is uh, a scan straight off the, the floor uh, of the Maritime Museum. And uh, I reconstructed this through a process called photogrammetry, which is taking lots and lots of photographs of an object and then essentially using trigonometry to piece back the, um, the, the locations of uh, the various parts of the model, uh, the, the object. And so it took me about 25 minutes maybe to photograph this object um, with, on a ladder. Uh, but then to get it to this stage is probably another, you know, it can be seven to 10 hours work for this sort of thing, um, but this 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 kind of um, this kind of uh, technique is very it, it's really great for museums. I'll show you some in a sec. It's great for museums to document and preserve their collections um, because it gives you a very very accurate uh, rendition of that object from which you can uh, do all sorts of things like use it for you know forensic analysis and whatnot. So this is another figurehead in the Maritime Museum's collection. It's on the wall. Um, Adam will have to tell you which, which one it is. But you could use this to, uh, you know, to construct a replica, either through industrial techniques like CNC milling or 3D printing. Um, we use them all the time for object conservation analysis, uh, for, for um, rendering and exhibition um, stuff but also just as an archival thing, for understanding the object itself, very, very useful technique. Uh, but this is something that, that museums uh, are just sort of starting to, to play with and um, you know, don't necessarily always have the, the kind of um, uh, you know, budget and skills and time for, but I'm very, very keen on this sort of thing uh, in order to, you know, for, for analytical purposes. 
fun. And while there you go, I already knew. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. Oh, all right. Thank you. Look, we will need to wrap up now. So thank you again to Adam and Andrew for spending time sharing um, the journey of developing this exhibition uh, with us. That's uh, it's been fabulous. And thank you all very much and, and stay tuned and keep in touch.